Welcome everybody to Feliciano Women in Business's first panel. I am Marissa Hackett and I am the president. Um, I am joined here today by numerous people. Um, well, we'll start by introducing the rest of the e-board. If you guys wanted to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Caroline Marinari. I am the continuity chair. Hello everyone, I'm Nick, uh, I am the treasurer. Hello everyone, I'm Manuela Paula, I am the vice president. Hello everyone, I am Mia Stevens and I am the secretary. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole and I am the community outreach coordinator. And of course we have the lovely four panelists today. Um, I will start by introducing Helene Becker. Helene is a managing director and senior research analyst at Cohen, focusing on airlines, air freight, and aircraft leasing. She has more than 35 years of experience on Wall Street, holding positions within the research, trading, and investment banking departments of several global broker slash dealers. She has been ranked as the number one, two, or three analyst by Institutional Investor Magazine, as well as in the top five analysts by the Wall Street Journal. Ms. Becker is currently ranked in the top three in various star mine analyst categories. Helene Becker holds a bachelor's degree from Montclair State University and a master's of business administration from New York University. All right, and then so I will introduce Keisha Hutchinson. So Keisha is an audit partner at KPMG. She provides professional audit services to several banking and broker dealer clients in accordance with, with PCAOB standards, US GAAP, and specialized accounting policies. Her audit experiences include conducting audits in compliance um, with Sabarnes Oxley SEC filing and FDI CIA filings. Keisha has the overall responsibility of planning and coordinating audit work and presenting at audit committee meetings for several large banking and broker dealer clients. Her responsibilities include working with these clients on financial accounting and reporting matters and delivering day-to-day -day services. She also has extensive experience delivering day-to-day -day services of public companies and reviewing SEC filings and has a thorough understanding of SEC rules and regulations. She also developed and presented firm-wide accounting and audit guidance for KPMG partners, professionals, and clients. Okay. And I will introduce Kathy Doherty. Kathy T. Doherty is a senior vice president, group executive in clinical fran franchise solutions and marketing for Quest Diagnostics. She is responsible for overseeing the development of service offerings in the area of cardiovascular, metabolic and endocrinology, infectious disease and immunology, prescription drug monitoring and toxicology, and general health and wellness. Ms. Doherty joined Twest Diagnostics in 1990 and most recently was Senior Vice President of Physician Services Business. Prior to that, she served as Vice President to Hospital Services and as Vice President in Office of the Chairman. A certified public accountant, Ms. Doherty graduated from Montclair State University and holds a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in accounting. We are also joined by uh, Dr. Kimberly Kilmer Halster. Uh, she is the first female dean of the Feliciano School of Business. Um, she is also a full time professor in the Department of Information Operations Management. Before coming to Montclair State, she held a lecturer position at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And her research focuses on ed the educational program assessment and applied operations management. So, without further ado, I'd like to bring the, your, your attention to Gail Yash. She will be the moderator for this, uh, for this panel. And Gail, you can take it away from here. Thank you, Marissa. And a warm welcome to our Feliciano Women in Business members and any guests joining us. I see we have a lot of people on the Zoom, which is wonderful. And a special warm welcome to our panelists. We had wanted to do this in April. And of course the world, it's 2020 and it completely changed and we had to adapt and adjust. And even now today, as we have internet issues and in the weather, but that's what we do. We adapt, we adjust, we reinvent ourselves 
which is a perfect segue into our topic today. So how I'll do this is I have three questions to ask each of our four panelists. And what I'll do is I'll go one by one, I'll ask the question and then we'll just see where the conversation goes. And um, after I ask all three questions of all four panelists, we will end with a Q&A session. And I understand that you'll have the ability as a, a panel, as a member here on the Zoom to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll address that at the end of the session. So we'll move right into reinventing ourselves. And I will start with Helene first. Helene, how have you reinvented yourself through the years, either by necessity or by choice to adapt, overcome and flourish? Well, thanks for the, um, thanks for the question. Yes, when you are on Wall Street, you very often have to reinvent yourself. And when you cover the airline, industry you really have to reinvent yourself so over um my career well three things i guess um the first is that um when i started i knew nothing and um i didn't say no to anything right i i took every challenge i accepted every assignment i did whatever i was asked and then i figured out a way to go above and beyond that so that um i tried to make myself indispensable in every role i had so that i would be looked upon as um as a resource mm -hmm. so that was the first thing i think i tried to do and then fast forward maybe 15 years, I'm just thinking how many, um, and maybe even longer. So, so, you know, in there, I had kids and um, kind of dealt with them, um, tried to be a really good mom. When, when my, when my son was getting married a couple of years ago, I said to him, you know, was I a good mom? I mean, you're marrying somebody who is in finance like me, she works long hours. Um, you know, was I a good mom? And he said, actually, you were a great mom. So I must have done something right. Mm -hmm. um, but as part of that, in I, I also down, I don't what's the right word, I sort of down gauged my career, instead of working for a, what we call a bulge bracket firm. So instead of working for JP Morgan, or Morgan Stanley, or somebody like that, I made the decision to work for an independent broker dealer. And I had to reinvent myself because working for a big firm, um, I was at Lehman at the time or Solomon Brothers, um, one of the two, <laughs> they all kind of sort of like the pandemic, they all kind of rushed together. Um, I was at, at one of them and, um, and my schedule wasn't my own. I had to drop everything I was doing and get on the next plane if we were doing deals. This was in the days when research analysts could also um, pitch business. And so I decided that I wanted to be around my kids more because in my opinion, if I didn't get them right, nothing else I did in life would matter. And um, so therefore I figured out um, that I needed to make this change of professionally and personally. And so I went to an independent firm, but the mission there is a lot different. At a big firm, somebody else does the asking for you. They ask for the order. In my case, now at an independent shop, I had to say to people, you don't work for free. Please don't ask me to work for free. If what I'm providing is valuable to you, please pay me for it. And if what I'm doing is not valuable, that's fine too. I will not interact with you anymore. So um, I had to figure that out. And, and it took a few months for me to do that. And I asked a couple of people at the new shop, you know, how are you getting paid? How are you doing this? And I happened upon, um, if you don't work for free, you know, you don't, don't ask me. So mm -hmm. that was that. And then fast forward to the last two decades ago now, and after the events of September 11th, when I was, um, I was doing airlines and, you know, I forecast that United would have to file for bankruptcy and then, which they did in December of 02, and then you not, um, Delta and Northwest Airlines filed in 2005. And, um, and actually forecast those two. I don't always get it right, but but I did get those three right. And the the important thing there is now I'm on the equity side in my business, um, which is means I'm on the stock side. 
And when they file for bankruptcy, there's no publicly traded equity. There is, however, publicly traded debt. And it would be an insult to the debt analyst to say I am a, or was a debt analyst, but what I did was I dragged out my old accounting books and um, I looked through, you know, the, the balance sheet and I looked to see what the hierarchy is, was of the debt that was outstanding. Um, I, I um, sat in on a class, um, uh, forensic accounting at, at NYU because it was not far from the office. So I could just pop over there and, and hear what the professor was saying about what to look for. Um, and so I, I had to rethink who my clients were going to be because I wasn't able to talk to equity analysts, I had to now talk to debt analysts. So I had to reinvent myself so that I would know what they knew um, because most of them knew more than I knew about the cap, what we call the capital structure. So that was, um, that wasn't easy. And um, because I'm not that um, smart <laughs> sometimes, but, you know, I learned it and I was able to talk about it. I was able to, you know, learn new customers, meet new people, um, built out my network, you know, again, built it out um, deeper. And, and I think a big part of my business throughout the 40 years or more than 40 years that I've done this now is, is just continuing to collect people and not lose touch with those people and, and being able to call on, on people to help me um, when I needed it. So I think those are like three ways I had to rethink my business um, and, uh, and, and, and to be successful. Because you know if you have to go to work, um, which as I explained to the kids when they were growing up, adults work, that's what we do. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't stay home. Um, I mean, if we can, I guess, suppose we do, but we work, right, right? The money, the money comes out of the machine on the wall, as my son pointed out when he was about four or five. Why can't we just go to the wall, mom, and get money when I said we don't have money to buy that toy? Um, and it was like a whole big thing about why we couldn't do that. Anyway, it was a big learning moment. <laughs> and um, so my line was always, you know, adults work. That's what we do. And kids go to school. That's what you do. And at night we have dinner together, um, which I did every time, you know, whenever I wasn't traveling. And A and B, um, then we all sat together and did our homework together. Um, even if I was just reading recipe books, which I wasn't, I, <laughs> but even if I was just reading, you know, magazines or whatever, I sat there with them because that's what they wanted. They didn't want me to help them with their homework as much as they wanted to just be with me. So excellent. excellent. Wonderful. And, you know, a cop, so a few themes I've heard you say, making yourself indispensable and knowing, having that confidence to know what, what your terms are. I'm going to do this, but I, I'm going to get paid for it or I'm not going to do it. And then also you said this constant learning. It sounded like that was a theme that you just made sure that if you didn't know something, you learned it. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, and you know, the thing about my business is, and I don't, you know, and again, I, I always say I'm unqualified to do anything other than my business, but you know, I'm a financial analyst first and foremost, and and the career is kind of an exciting career. Certainly, we can talk about it in the Q and A because you can go a lot of places from financial um, analysis. One of my former competitors is now co CFO of Delta Airlines. So, um, I mean, that's you know the that's going to be that's a huge opportunity. You can go to strategic planning. There's lots of stuff you can do. But anyway, the point in, in saying that is, yeah, you, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and in my case, when the airlines were in bankruptcy, um, and I had to say, I had to figure out a way to be relevant. It's, it's being relevant. And um, I mean, I suppose I could have changed careers, which, which, you know, I, I guess I never really thought about doing because I really love the business so much. But um, in order to be relevant, I had to figure out how to do that. And I know enough to know I couldn't do it by myself. I needed somebody to tell me what I should be looking for. It had been years. I mean, this was 2002 yeah. to 2006. And um, I graduated from Montclair in 1979 with like one accounting class, right? I didn't, I wasn't in the business school. I was my major wasn't business. Um, and then my MBA was 84. 
So it had been, you know, 15, 18 years since I had mm -hmm. had thought about it. And I was not, in, if I was going to have intelligent conversations, I couldn't fake it. You can't, yeah. Yeah. you can fake mm -hmm. it when other people know what you don't know. And one of the things that you learn over the years in, in this, this particular role is to say a lot, um, what didn't I ask you? Like what, yeah. and I do that, I do that today. I do that every time I talk to a, a company CEO or CFO or IRO, investor relations officer, you know, what are, uh, what are my competitors asking you? What are my clients asking you? What are other people asking you that I'm not asking yeah. you? What do I need to know that I don't know? And especially just starting out, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and, like and I know it sounds silly, but you just, you have no clue what the relevant um, aspects of the job are. So you have to ask lots of questions and, and not worry that you're going to ask something dumb. Because even if it is, sometimes other people are thinking it, they just don't want to be the one to ask it. And excellent points, really. It's fine. You can ask it and nobody ever okay. questions that. Wonderful. So let's keep on going. Kathy, I'm going to ask you the same question. How have you reinvented yourself throughout the years, necessity or by choice or what have you? Yeah, so um, so one, I think Elaine uh, summed up, uh, you know, uh, some very good points. And um, as indicated at the very beginning, um, I've been at Quest Diagnostics for 30 years. And, and quite frankly, you can't stay at an organization that long and think you're going to advance your career and not invent yourself, no matter what position you hold. And so, you know, some of it was out of necessity. But I think, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, you know, I love learning, right? And when I started, you know, I graduated from Montclair with an accounting degree. And, and what I would tell you is that oftentimes, you know, folks, uh, you know, have this perception that, you know, accountants, you know, sit in the corner, they, you know, don't interact a lot, they, you know, kind of work, you know, on their computer. And, and, um, and that wasn't what I was, right? I really wanted to add value to the business. And so this notion of figuring out how to be in a constant learning mode is really, really important. Um, it, it's invaluable. And, and um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, I'm always um, evaluating whether or not I continue to become more marketable. Right. So, you know, I, I think, um, and I forget the gentleman that introduced me, you know, I happen to be leading clinical franchises and marketing for the organization. You know, it's rather unusual that somebody that has an accounting degree is actually overseeing marketing. But, you know, through the, the years, through my experiences, you know, I've been able to learn a whole lot, right? So it's both experience and education, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people. Um, but what I would say is, um, you know, and always striving, obviously, to, to be the best, you know, when I started my career, I started at one of the big six. And, you know, at that time, and I'm not sure what they do now, you know, they rank their levels, right? So, you know, I wanted to understand, you know, am I kind of one or two, right? That's what I was striving to be. And, and the other thing that I would say, and, and I think this has been, you know, a, a catalyst for reinventing myself is, is, constantly kind of coming to the table to say, hey, I've got bandwidth, right? You know, you, you try something, you, you kind of start doing something new, you figure out how to master it, and then you say, I can do more, you know? And I think, again, that creates that learning process and, you know, the ability to do more is kind of how I might describe reinventing myself. Yeah, wonderful. Again, a, a theme of constant learning, that constant learning and always being open to do something else. So that's wonderful. Okay, Keisha, you're up next. How have you reinvented yourself throughout the years? Good afternoon, and thank you, Gail. And I, I think I'll continue with the theme of constant learning. And I think there was also a theme of challenging yourself a bit, and I'll probably include that in um, my uh, scenario. So I'll tell you, and I think you said it in the beginning, when, when you think about rein, um, uh, re-engaging or reinventing your, your, your career, you know, it's either by choice or it could be forced. And I'll tell you, my, ex my experience to date have been by choice. So probably nine or so years into my career at KPMG, I, I just felt like I was going through the motions, just uh, I wasn't as engaged and as passionate about my profession as I was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, started to have the discussion with others of what are some other things um, that's available within the organization. And I was, um, uh, told about the, our, our national office and, and an opportunity to do a rotation. And, and in our national office, 
what I do on my daily basis, it's more auditing client service in our national office. We're more, more focused on technical accounting. And that's what I saw myself doing a year, two years from, from that point in time when I was just struggling with what, what do I want to do? So did that rotation for three years in our national office, focused a lot on implementation of new accounting standards, working with our regulators, developing training materials for our, our engagement team. And then I did that for three years and ultimately it just gave me a different viewpoint on how to approach my career, my profession. And I came back into the field as an auditor and um, continue now to serve as clients, but with a different approach, a different mindset and a different feel. So overall, I do think reinventing your career comes in a number of different forms, whether it's forced, whether it's challenging yourself or that theme of continuous learning. Sure, Sean, you bring up a good point that when you open yourself up to that continuous learning, you get different perspectives. So you see different angles. And in the end, that makes you even better at those new roles that you encounter and you go into. So that's a wonderful thing. Yes, well, thank you. So next up, Kimberly, you are in, in an environment that is about constant learning. So how have you reinvented yourself throughout the years? Oh, I think you're on mute. Thanks, Gail. So when I think of when I think of that question, I think about even right from the beginning of when I was thinking about what I wanted to do. I was debating, you know, um, before I went to college, did I want to be a music teacher or did I want to be an engineer? Um, ended up doing neither of those things, but was able to incorporate some music stuff when, while I pursued my degree in engineering. Mm -hmm. um, came to Montclair State as a faculty member, and you know, gradually over time, took on some leadership responsibilities at committee level. And about 12 years in, I was asked if I would come up to the dean's office um, when we were bringing in a new external dean who hadn't been a dean uh, before. And, and it was kind of trial by fire, I've described it. I, you know, I, when Helene gave her answer, initially she said, I didn't know anything um, and you never say no. And so I knew not to say no, so I knew to say yes and, and spent a year where you, you know, where I, where you asking questions every day, trying to understand it. And at the same time, you know, realizing you don't know very much and realizing that I really loved what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so the reinventing for me, I think has been changing as the, as the institution has changed, the university as well as the school and, and learning from the people who I've worked with, um, worked for now um, three, three different deans um, when I was in my role as associate dean and as vice dean and I think there's always takeaways that you can get and you can always look for opportunities to lead initiatives. And fortunately for me, it, you know, in the end, I was able to move and, and shift into this position, which, you know, still realizing how much I need to learn and how much I need to grow. Yeah, sure. I think we've heard from, from all of you that this idea that to not say no to opportunities come your way and to embrace them, even if you don't know. But that's a good segue into the next question. And I'll, I'll stick with you, Kimberly, and then I'll, I'll go backwards in the rotation. When you don't say no to opportunities that come, how then do you balance the many hats that you end up wearing both professionally and personally in your life? And then what's the key to, to getting that balance? I, mean, I think that's the eternal question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and in Helene's earlier answer, she, you know, she, she mentioned that, how do you balance the, the role? So, you know, the balance, in my case, it's your, your work life, your work persona, and, and the different um, members of your team, and how do you balance the different needs there? How do you balance what we need in the school versus what the entire institution needs? You know, the, the requests that come from there. And then, then frankly, on the, the more important side of, of, of the world, you know, how do I balance my family? And, you know, uh, early on in my career, one of the deans said, you know, there's all these pieces, all these puzzle pieces to your life and you juggle them constantly of, you know, which ones, how do you put them together and how do you work? And you have to focus that some of the only one that breaks usually is your family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, it's been finding that, that balance of making sure that I am home for dinner and that I'm present when I'm home and I'm present when mm -hmm. I'm at work. And, and, and for me, I also work better when I have that opportunity to take a, a completely take a step away, you know, go for a walk, go skiing, be outside. And it helps me when I come back in to be able to then see clearly and to, and to chart that path forward. Definitely. So important to take that break. Absolutely. And, and sometimes, and I'm not, not for all women, but I could speak for myself when I say that, is um, when you don't say no to things you, and then you tend to want to do everything yourself because you know you can do it really well. 
and to be able to rely on some other people on your team and in your in your world to be able to to help you with that. So that's great. All right, Keisha, how about you? How how do you balance the hat you wear and, and how do you strike that balance? Yeah, great question. And a, a, a point you made in terms of um, your support system being important, I'll say that's the key to me finding, a, a, I'll say work-life balance. I prefer to say integration because I feel like it's a struggle to find real balance, right? But, but I do think um, in our professional careers in corporate America, you wear many different hats, whether it's a professional title, um, being a mom, I have two children, being a wife, being a daughter or sister, you could name it. There's a ton of different roles that we play and we need to somehow find that strike, that right balance or in integration. And I'll, I'll say for me, it really is prioritizing. Um, I live by my calendar. So my personal events are on my calendar. My professional events are on my calendar. And the other thing that I say is very important. It's, and I say this to my daughter, I say this to uh, uh, the younger individuals that I, that I mentor, it's, being fair, being fair to yourself and being fair to your profession. Because I'll tell you, there are points in times where your profession is gonna be more important than your family. And there are times when your family is going to be more um, important than, than your profession. And I find that when I'm fair to both, I don't find myself constantly second guessing myself and struggling with, am I doing right by my family? Am I doing right by my profession? Because I know, you know, for me, my busy time at work is February. And my daughter also plays basketball. And that's typically the time when a lot of the final games are coming around. And I want to be at the, those games are the important ones, right? I put them in my calendar. She'll probably play four or five games. I know I'll try to make two of them. And then there's probably two that I'm not going to make because I have client meetings deadlines. But if I try, if I make those two, I feel good that I'm giving to her. And I'm also meeting my professional deadline, as, um, deadline and meetings as well. So I think it's prioritizing and then also just being fair to both your profession as well as your personal life. Absolutely. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm nodding as you're going along and I see all the panel members on the top of my screen nodding as well. So I think we all feel that that uh, as a woman with with many hats that we wear and, and bringing that balance in family and work. OK, Kathy, how about you? Yeah, no, um, I think Keisha said it very, very well. And I, I think the other thing that we need to remind ourselves of is that everybody defines balance differently. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think we need to accept that because, you know, oftentimes, you know, we want to judge and, and quite frankly, women can be the worst um, of this. And, and I think it's really important that we accept how folks want to balance, women want to balance, and we support that of each other, right? That's number one. And, and to what Keisha said, look, it, you know, like any other relationship, there isn't balance every day, right? There's, there but you hope that there's going to be balance over this period of time. And, and that's what I strive for. You know, when, when Keisha talked about, you know, kind of February and, you know, basketball season, you know, it's, it's about being fair to both. And, and at times, you know, you might over index on work and, you know, a little bit down the road, you might over index on family. I, I think that what, what's also really important is the prioritization, but um, it's also being present meaning being present where you are. Um, I, I think it matters so much because again, it's not always about quantity, it's about quality. And being present enables you to, um, you, whatever that present is, whatever that situation you're being present in, it, it allows you to show up in a quality way. And that to me, is um, you know what's really important, and then of course you know the support system. Um, I don't think that we can live without it, and I don't want to take up a lot of time. But um, you know, while I was at Quest Diagnostics, we moved our headquarters out of Bergen County into to Madison, New Jersey, which created a really long commute for me. And at the very beginning, um, I actually was uh, chief of staff to the CEO. So Kimberly, like you. Um, it, it was really a crazy, crazy, crazy time. And he was a new CEO. And I remember coming home one evening and my daughter was a senior in high school at the time, you know, a really important year. She played volleyball and softball. And I thought I wasn't going to get to do anything, right? Because I lived in, and worked in Bergen County. And that allowed me to kind of leave work, go to a game, come back to the office and do my thing. And that just was going away. And I came home and uh, it just so happened that we were having dinner together. My husband was with my boys and I started to tell her, I, you know, I, I just don't know if this is going to work. I don't, I, you know, I feel like I'm missing out. And, and my daughter said to me, mom, 
oh my gosh, do you know how important um, what it is you do for our family? Do you know how much I love that about you? And you know what, it, you know, 10 years from now, do you think I'm going to remember that you didn't go to my volleyball game? She goes, my friends wish they had a mother like you. I want to be just like you. And, and so that was like, oh gosh, you know, I guess I am okay. Right. Cause we all have doubts, especially I think in the motherhood side, I have less doubts in the work side. And, um, but, you know, and so she said, I want to be just like you. And I said, well, you know, you really need that support system, you know, dad is really, really important to this equation. She goes, you know, I'm going to have, you know, one of those too. So uh, again, um, you know, balance can be defined a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. And I think we need to accept how that individual defines balance for them versus judging. Sure. Kathy, thank you for sharing that story. I see the heads nodding. And as a mom of two young girls, um, I had little tears in my eyes just now because I, I struggle with the same. And if my daughter said that, I that really goes to the heart. So thank you. Okay, Helene, how about you? How did you balance those hats you wear? <laughs> how do you? <laughs> yeah, well, everybody said it well, so I won't repeat what, what's been said. The only thing I would add is learning how to say no was really important for me. Um, and not just saying, okay, yes, I'll do that. Um, there came a time where, you know, everybody, Keisha said it well, when, when, you know, I put everything as well in my calendar. And there were some events, my son was a nationally ranked fencer. Um, at one point, he was going to the Olympics. Um, and we had to travel around the country. And at one point, the world, and then he got old enough when he was about 16, 17, I let him travel with his teammates and his coach. And he, he went on his own. Um, but I also learned how to say no to a lot of things in the school that didn't directly impact my children. If it directly impacted them and I could be there, I was all over it. But when it was just some random like, oh, go work in the library on a Tuesday and my kid's time in the library was Wednesday, um, it was like, no, that's not for me. That's just not going to work. So, so knowing how to say no, which is not easy for me. Um, was very important. Um, the support system, I think having a good partner is really critical. Having a husband that, you know, you agree. We used to sit down on um, on Sunday. Sunday night was sacrosanct. You, everybody, especially as the kids get older, I mean, when they're little, you have 100% control over their lives. They're there. You're, you know, dinner is at six o'clock and that's your family or dinner is at eight o'clock and that's what you get used to. And and it's fine, kids will get used to anything, but as they get older and their after school activities start to eat into the dinner time, for me, Sunday night was sacrosanct and we all had to be, whatever else you did, you had to be present at seven o'clock on Sunday night for dinner. And then we all had our, now, you know, it's not as, um, now remember my kids, you know, were born in 88 and 92. So we're, we're not talking about iPhones and stuff here. We're talking about, you know, coming to the table with our schedules. <laughs> and, and after dinner, we sat there and we all went through what's Monday, what's Tuesday, what's through, you know, through Thursday night. Um, because it was expected Friday night, we would, we would be together for dinner again. And, um, and that was really important. And, and, you know, everybody said it, be present when you're there. I used to tell them, I'm not very good at this myself, but um, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, so, you know, do twice as much listening as talking. <laughs> oh no, I'm not so good at that either. And um, the other thing is being present. Kathy said this well too. When you talk to somebody, look them right in the eye. If you, if you look somebody in the eye and you um, are really present and you're listening and you're not thinking about what you're going to say next, because if you think about conversations, most conversations really are about, okay, I'm listening to you, but I'm really thinking what I want to say. And people will interrupt and so on. Um, but if you actually are present and you're there and you look someone in the eye and you nod from time to time and you ask a question, you will be so beloved. People, whatever else you do, people will think, oh my God, that Helene, she is amazing. Do you know she heard everything I said? <laughs> and I'll tell you, my husband says, I hear nothing of what he says. <laughs> that, um, but it's a trick that will, will 
that hold you well in, in life in general. And everybody else said everything else that, that I would, you know, totally agree with. Wonderful. Wonderful. You raise a wonderful point. I teach business communications and listening is a huge part of communications and interpersonal communication and connecting with people. So that's wonderful. All right, we are up to our last question. It's my favorite question because, um, well, hopefully you had a time to think about this. I did give the panelists the question beforehand because this is something you need to think about. And so I'll start with Helene and go the other way again. If you could speak to your 20 something self, what advice would you give her about your career and your life? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, you know, I saw the question when we were going to do the panel last spring and I saw it again um, when you sent it. Um, I guess the one thing I would say to my 20 something self is it's going to be okay. Um, you're going to have ups and downs. Things are not going to work out 100%. Life isn't, um, as we say in, in my business, up and to the right. You know, it's, um, it's not going to be perfect. You're going to have setbacks. Um, and it's okay. Every setback is a learning opportunity. Um, don't take everything so seriously, <laughs> which I definitely have a tendency to do. And don't take everything so personally. Um, you know, I, men don't. Men are very, and you watch a lot of professional athletes who, you know, especially golf. We watch a lot of golf in my house. Um, I watch a lot of tennis and people talk about Rafa Nadal this way, um, who's a, you know, obviously fabulous tennis player. Um, he doesn't dwell on the, the point he missed. He just moves on to the next thing. Golfers the same. They don't dwell on the fact that they just double bogeyed, you know, the penultimate hole and the masters taking them from, you know, a two point lead to or, or a two shot lead to, to a tie. Um, they, they don't think that they just on to the next. Um, I saw that with my son, my son, when he was fencing, um, it was the same, and, and it was always the first person to 15-1, and it was the kind of thing where if it was 13-13, he wouldn't think, he never thought, I asked him about this a lot, he never thought, oh my god, I need the next two points, one at a time. So I would tell myself, you know, it's gonna be okay, and life is, is just what, you know, don't get hung up on the little stuff, just be happy, be happy, and, and um, right. I think that's the most important thing that that, that I probably have learned over the years to just not think so much about the five-year plan as much as just live in the moment because Wonderful. the moment can end at any point in time. Excellent. All right, Kathy, how about you? What would you say to your 20-something self? Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I'm going to build on Helene, right? Because that's what this is, right? I, I think, um, you know, we're all a little bit wiser, you know, however many years later that we don't like to uh, announce. But I think, you know, um, a couple of things. I think that um, when I think about my 20 year old self, I, I would, would have said, hey, I think you should have networked more. You know, I, I always thought that networking was something that happened after work. And, um, and, and therefore I couldn't do it because I was kind of balancing. Um, and I, I think it, it doesn't have to happen after work. It's part of your job. And it, it's really important to build relationships and keep those connections alive. I, I, I really think that's important. Um, and again, you know, I, I uh, like Lane, tend to be pretty serious, you know, nose to the grindstone. And, and I think women have that tendency and, you know, it's really important to lift up, look around and talk to the people near you. And again, network. Um, I also think that, you know, when we start, you know, our careers, um, we sometimes may be constrained by, you know, our level or our job description. Mm -hmm. And what I would tell everyone is, look, you know, we're, we're all the same, no matter what level um, you're at in an organization, uh, you know, we're people, um, we deserve respect uh, and to give and, and to get respect. But you know, we all put our our pants on one leg at a time, and so don't be intimidated by you know level and job description. Mm -hmm. And then um, you know, lastly, um, you know, don't be afraid uh, to take risks and don't be afraid to fail. You know, go outside your comfort zone and and take on new roles. And and although you might find things that are not a perfect fit for you, mm -hmm. you're going to have learned during the way. So. Um, again, just be open um, to uh, open to that 
change and 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 embrace it um and and don't strive for perfection um I, i'm not even sure that it, it's something that really exists excellent yeah like they say life begins outside of your comfort zone right okay keisha mm -hmm. how about you what advice would you give your 20 something self Sure, thank you. And I've definitely, even though I, I'm, I'm preparing myself to respond, I'm taking notes and Elena and Kathy uh, raised some very great points. And the one Kathy that I definitely need to take note of is, is that concept of networking does not only occur outside of work, but during work also, because that's one that I continue to uh, struggle with and try to work on. So definitely um, we'll pick your brain a little bit more on, on that concept. But, but what I would tell my 20 something self, what advice I would give, you know, I, I um, summed it up in, I would say avoid self-limiting beliefs. Mm. And um, there's this author, Don Miguel Ruiz, who um, sums this up very well in his book, um, The Four Agreements. And um, one of my mentors recently recommended that book to me. And The Four Agreements is simply this. It says, be impeccable with your words. Um, don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. And I don't know that I need to say much more on any of those because I feel like Helene comments uh, touched on a, a number of those of, of those four agreements Kathy did as well the one that I would probably see a little bit more on it is don't take anything personally and, and I know and I and I chose that one because I think as females it's very easy for us to take a small mistake and make it personal right and trap or and trap ourselves and the author actually says when you when you take things personally you're trapping yourself in hell if we trap ourselves in this, we make we take these mistakes and make them defining moments and they value our self-worth. And what I've learned over the years is the mistakes that we make, no one remembers them. It's how we bounce back from those mistakes Wonderful. that's important. So, you know, I, I do think uh, not much more to say, but I, you know, just to go over those four advice or those four agreements again, it's be impeccable with your words, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions, and then always do your best. Excellent book. I've read it twice and I have a sign in my office with the four agreements on it. So I agree. And Kimberly, what's, what's the name of the book again? It's called The Four Agreements, right, Keisha? Okay. Four Agreements. Yep. So Kimberly, what advice would you give your 20-something self? So I think to, to keep learning, as just as Keisha said, I, I, I've been taking notes as, as everyone else is talking because it's, it's, uh, because it, it, it's always great to learn from other people. I would say Part of it is goes to the like don't sweat the small things you know make your you don't want to focus all your energy on the things that you can't change and and the small things that in the end are going to matter and so and and the realization that you're never going to make everybody happy you're not going to be able to meet everybody's needs so how do you and it's okay you know if that's okay you just have to focus on what you know what you believe the priorities are for the role that you're in at at that time and sometimes I think as women, we need to take a step back and to see how far we've come and what we are able to accomplish because we get buried in the, you know, you're, you're, you're constantly going in, in all the various roles that we've all, all discussed. Um, I think the, the skill of listening, like as, as Helene said, you know, really listening to other people and then, you know, speaking when you have something to contribute to the conversation, no matter what you're no matter what your role is. Mm -hmm. um, and as I've moved into leadership positions, you know, I think a lot of things going to, to building teams and to, you know, you don't have to like everybody, but you do need to respect everybody and respect the, what they bring to the table and, um, and that all jobs are important from, you know, moving furniture, if that's what needs to get done because, you know, something happened and that's where the speaking event is going to happen to, you know, to, to helping to put together papers for a, you know, for a meeting that you might have, you know, just roll up your sleeves, do what needs to get done and appreciate everyone who's around you. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, this concludes our panel discussion. We went a little bit over, but we do have time for some Q and A. So I think we can open it up to that now. Thank you everyone. I took notes as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, so one question I have, um, what is one of your proudest uh, accomplishments uh, throughout your career? And anyone can answer. 
I'll, I'll probably say my, if I'm thinking of my professional career, my proudest moment was probably when I made partner at KPMG because starting out, you know, when I started at KPMG, I, I never envisioned myself um, being a partner, that my goal was, you know, getting to senior associate, getting to manager. And um, the moment I made partner, I, I felt a, a sense of accomplishment. You know, it kind of, I guess, validated it, it for lack of a better word, um, the hard work that I put in and the commitments and the sacrifices that I made. Um, so I, I do think, you know, when you meet certain, certain milestones in your professional career, it just gives you that sense of accomplishment, not that you need validation, but at least you, you have something to point to, to say, you know, the sacrifices I made, um, the hard work that I, the time that I invested, um, it, it's coming to fruition. Anyone else would like to answer? Um, this is Helene. I would just say for me, it's being right <laughs> because um, for me, it's, it, you get that constantly. If I say, you know, something and then the stock goes, because it's equities in the market. If I say something and the stock goes up or down and I was right, that makes me feel really good. And that's good validation that I'm doing my job. But my proudest stuff is my kids. Um, work is wonderful and I love it. I love what I do and I'm happy for my career and I'm grateful for it. But I, I just adore my children. And for me, getting them right was the most important thing. Um, and the proud, the, what I'm most proud of in, in terms of my life. I, I am really proud that my kids turned out, knock on wood, um, pretty good. <laughs> they're, they're contributing members to the society right now. <laughs> mm. Nobody's on the dole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only other thing I would add is actually bringing those two things together. Um, and, and that is, you know, uh, having a, a successful career and being able to be a mom um, and not uh, having to choose, be, choose one or the other. And I, I can't stress enough that, you know, to, how um, rewarding it's been to have both. And I, whenever I get a chance to talk to a young woman that, you know, you know, maybe struggling with, hey, is this the right time? And, you know, all that stuff. I, I, you know, am a big believer, go for it, you're gonna figure it out. Like, and it's, and it's the, it's the two pieces together that make you whole. And, um, and, and it's, it can be done. Kimberly, would you like to add? I, it, it's interesting. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that I think it's really interesting and, and it's fantastic that you, you have four of us on the panel and, and all of us at different stages in terms of how old our kids are have all balanced that or, or, or made both work, right? You know, I am so proud of my family and, you know, and, and, and what, they, what they're, what, who they are and, and, and what our life is like outside of here, as well as you know, what I've been able to accomplish in, in the school. And I think, you know, too many times people think of it as, as always, you know, a binary choice that you can, you can have success in one, but you can't have it in, in others. And, um, you know, it goes back to, you know, the Kathy's comment before about, you know, people judge each other and, you know, never, you, you just can't, right. You have to, everyone judges their own success the way they do. And, you know, and I think, and we have to support each other more as women in all of our roles. Great. Thank you. Another question uh, I have, when you had a business idea that didn't work out, how did you bounce back? Well, um, I can start I'll, there. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, um, Elaine. Oh, I was just going to say, because for me, you know, it's being wrong, right? And, um, and here was one, this is a great example. Um, very early in my career, maybe a year and a half into what I was doing, I was a senior analyst. Um, and I was wrong about something. I completely underestimated the cash flow burn of one of the companies under my coverage. Um, they were going through cash faster than I ever realized they could, A, and B, by the time I figured it out, it was about a month before they filed for bankruptcy. Um, so um, they file, I, 
I said they would. They filed. Um, but what made it worse was was one of the um, brokers at the firm I was working for at the time um, had a relationship with a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. And I don't know if you read the Wall Street Journal, but there's a column called Heard on the Street. And they did a whole Heard on the Street column about how stupid I was, um, <laughs> which if you, um, you know, know that I mean, that paper goes out to everybody. It's readable. I mean, the good news is you probably can't find it now because it's like now it gets out there in, in the internet and you never lose it. When it got out there in, I guess, 90, I don't know, it was in the early 90s, maybe 89, 90, 91, somewhere in there. Um, you know, I mean, it's horrifying, right? Mortifying. Here, I, I know I made a mistake. I, I miscalculated. I, I underestimated. Um, and I was wrong, and yet here I was being called out for it, you know, very publicly. And, um, you know, I didn't know what to do. So I went to my boss and I said, you know, oh my God, this is like the worst day of my life. And of course, it's kind of an overstatement. You never like to see yourself in the press for anything bad. Um, it wasn't the worst day of my life, but, but it was disappointing. Um, and so he said, look, people will forget about this in a week or two when something else comes along and it's more impactful. And, you know, just, you know, do your job, put your head down, do your work, you'll recover. It's not the end of the world. And just hearing that made me feel better. Um, but here it is, you know, I don't remember the exact year, but I mean, 1990 to 2020 is still a long time and I've never forgotten it. Um, it made me a better analyst on the other hand, but. But I mean, it was it was pretty devastating when it happened, and um, you know, I just I, I was um, I think I was very also very um, insecure about my work after that. I went to my boss a lot and said, "Can you just check this? This is my thought." You know, this, and then I ran a lot of stuff by him. And after about six months of that, he's like, "Lane, you've got this. Just it's fine." And and um, and so that that was good. But yeah, at this time, it was it was. It was quote unquote the end of the world, even though you know, obviously my, my, my whatever so, my something self now goes, oh okay, I got over it. But at the time, it was pretty bad. Would anyone else like to share? I mean, if I was going to just share quickly, I think, I mean, there's always been, there's been bad decisions, you know, we try to start programs and, and you know, and it, and it doesn't work. I think my, what, if I look at the, the time that, you know, was the most disappointing or the, the most challenging was, was when something didn't work out personally um, in terms of, you know, wanting to be actually in the position that I'm in now. And it didn't work out at the first time that that opportunity came around. And and, and I think it's the, what you, what do you learn from it at the end and how do you bring it forward? How do you take, you know, how do you learn to, to still be a contributing person and to keep your career going forward and to, you know, look for that next opportunity that comes along. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for all the panelists and answering the question and being able to um, speak to all of our students today. You provided excellent advice and sharing your perspective. Uh, so thank you all. Yes, also I'd like to thank everybody as well for, I know it's been a long year in the, in the making, but we finally came together and, and it was a successful panel, I believe. Thank you all for your insight. It was really helpful. And also I will be checking out that book that Keisha mentioned. <laughs> Thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, stay dry. It's really bad out there. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.